I've had the privilege of knowing John Eidsmo for a number of years. He spoke at uh, a Worldview Conference uh, back in around 2005, we figured, at the uh, Schwann Retreat and Conference Center, which, which was the uh, uh, retreat and conference center owned by Bethany Lutheran College for a number of years. And so we had him up there to speak, and it was a wonderful presentation. We've uh, stayed in touch uh, over the years somewhat. Um, and then when his name was proposed for presenting here, it only made sense. And, and uh, I'd just like to point out that uh, in the bio here about the speakers, uh, I really had to reduce this greatly because the man is, is uh, so involved in so many things and so well educated and uh, travels uh, internationally to uh, speak not only about Christian apologetics but also in the area of law. He is a, he is a lawyer. Uh, retired Air Force Colonel, professor, uh, attorney, and a number of other things. I mean, and he just is non-stop, non-stop. And uh, uh, as it is sometimes said of him, uh, in spite of all these things that he does, he still tries to get eight hours of sleep each week. And uh, Professor Eismo will be speaking on a particular worldview and how it has impacted churches. So please welcome uh, Professor John Eismo. I want to thank you all first for the warm welcome you've given me as I've been here with you these last couple of days. And seeing some old friends again, like Pastor Thompson, like Representative Quist and Julie, like the McPhersons, and another friend of mine who is with us here tonight, Dr. Phil Wold. Dr. Wold and I were in junior high school together. He wasn't a doctor then, but anyway, back in Sioux City, Iowa, and he is a physician here in Mankato and is very much involved with, like for example, on the board of the Institute of Lutheran Theology. And anyway, I was just kind of figuring out, going back to junior high school, I think our friendship must have gone nearly 60 years. But anyway, it's just great to be with all of you here. You probably already figured out that I'm not originally from Alabama. When I came there, I had applied to teach at a law school, and they asked me whether I could fit into the South, and I said, no problem, sir, I was born in the South. And when they asked where, I had to say South Dakota. <laughs> My wife has a little more difficulty adjusting than I do, because she's from North Dakota. But they let me teach without an interpreter, and we enjoyed our stay there very much. I'm going to be talking about a false worldview and the way it has eroded biblical errancy and the inerrancy in the churches. But let's take a look, first of all, at the book of Jude and think about what Jude admonishes us, that we are to contend earnestly for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Contending earnestly for the faith can take many different contexts. Sometimes, as with Islam, it has been in a military context. Sometimes, as dealing with secularism or Darwinism or other non-Christian religions, it involves defending the faith against the false claims of other religions. Sometimes, though, it involves defending the faith that was once delivered unto the saints against heretical movements within the church itself. And I'm going to be talking about the movement that we have known through our lifetimes as religious liberalism, a movement that came into the Lutheran church later than in many other churches, but which has infected some Lutheran bodies nevertheless. And it's important that we understand what this is and how to deal with it, what it means. I think just about everybody here, if you were asked, what do you think of religious liberalism? Oh, that's bad. Well, could you define it? That might be more difficult. My hope today is to help us understand how this movement arose, what it is, what its implications are, and how to counter it. 
Let me begin with a little background. I'll begin by saying that the founding of this nation, we were primarily a professing Christian nation. Now, there weren't a lot of Lutherans in America back at that time. There were a few. In fact, there is some reason to believe that one of our presidents, John Hansen, never heard of President John Hansen, he was president of the Continental Congress back in the early 1780s, that he was of Danish background and probably Lutheran. And we have several others that we can talk about. We go to the Constitutional Convention itself, and there at the convention, you have 28 members of the Church of England, which at that time was an Orthodox church, holding to the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the authority of Scripture, and the 39 Articles. You had seven Presbyterians. They're your fiery Calvinists. You had, you had six, pres, or six Congregationalists. That's your New England Puritans. You had two Dutch Reformed. You had two Lutherans. I think that might have been the Minnesota delegation, except I don't think they made it to the convention. You had two Methodists, two Roman Catholics, one whose religious preference we don't know what it was. He was buried in an Episcopal churchyard, indicating probable church membership, but we don't know that for sure. And that leaves about three that you might describe as unorthodox. That's about 6%. We can look to the founding of America with Anglicans with some Puritan leanings in the southern colonies like Jamestown, Puritans mostly in the northern colonies. And we can see how as we move into the 1700s, there starts to be a slide into deism and Unitarianism. But deism and Unitarianism never really did take off during that period much. They were largely arrested by a religious revival in the 1740s that we know as the First Great Awakening, still further arrested in the early 1800s by the Second Great Awakening, and by another great religious revival that took place during the war between the states in both the northern armies and the southern armies. But we do see Unitarianism particularly gradually making inroads in America. Unitarianism at th those times would have been much more conservative than it is today. Many of them would say that they believe the Bible and that they believe in biblical morality. They just don't believe the Bible teaches a trinity. Today they've moved a long, long way from that position. And out of Unitarianism, the rise of a movement that came to be known as Transcendentalism. If you had high school American literature courses and you've been reading of Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau and Nathaniel Hawthorne and many of these other writers of that time, they would come out of this movement, a movement that Instead of original sin, they believe that we have a divine spark within us, and all we need to do is take that divine spark and fan it into flames, and we'll develop the inner God within us. Very, very different from a biblical concept of original sin and a biblical concept of salvation by the grace of Jesus Christ. So this is some of the climate that we see in America in the early 1800s. And now as religious liberalism begins to arise in the later 1800s, let's look at a few movements that have an influence upon it. One of these would certainly be Darwinism, and several of our other speakers have addressed Darwinism already. Darwinism, we think of first of all as the theory of evolution, that is gradual change through the mechanism of the natural selection or survival of the fittest, but I'm thinking of evolution more in the sense of a comprehensive worldview. Richard Hofstetter, an American sociologist in his book, Social Darwinism in American Thought, says, many scientific discoveries affect ways of living more profoundly than evolution did, but none have had a greater impact on ways of thinking and believing. In this respect, the space age does not promise even remotely to match it. And to see how 
in our pursuit of evolution, how this has become a worldview that has affected the way we look at sociology, of economics, of anthropology, history, and we're going to see even theology, Darwinism has an influence that I don't think it is possible to understate. Some of you may recall the British left-wing intellectual Malcolm Muggeridge, whose life was transformed by Jesus Christ. Malcolm Muggeridge wrote late in life, I am convinced that the theory of evolution, especially to the extent to which it has been applied, will be one of the greatest jokes in the history books of the future. Posterity will marvel that so very flimsy and dubious a hypothesis could be accepted with the incredible credulity it has. Last year, I've had a chance to speak to a couple of conferences on creation in Asia, and we're talking about literal six-day creation. One of these was in Nepal. The other was in Okinawa just a few weeks ago. In between these, I've been teaching for the law school at the Handong International Law School in South Korea. And so it's a little bit of a change to come here. I'm used to being the tallest person in the room wherever I am. And by the way, I bring you greetings from the Association of Free Lutheran Congregations, which shares your Norwegian heritage, as well as your commitment to the inerrancy of Scripture and to the confessions and symbols of the Lutheran Church. But an American scientist was at a scientific conference in China. And there at that conference, he was amazed at how critical these Chinese scientists were of Darwinian evolution, including scientists that were not even Christians. When he commented on this, one of the scientists said, well, in China, we can't criticize the government, but we can criticize Darwin. In America, you can criticize the government, but you can't criticize Darwin. Well, you can, but chances are you won't get hired at a university or get tenure or get your thesis published or things like that. But Darwinism certainly has had a major, major effect. Another would be just the concept of progress itself. As we move into the 1800s in America, it just seems like everything is moving upward. Everything is getting better and better. Manifest destiny as we are spreading democracy from sea to shining sea. New developments in power with steam and oil and electricity. And in medicine, we're discovering cures that are increasing lifespan. And now that we're having public education, well, Horace Mann once made the statement that once we expand the public school, poverty and crime and all of these evils will disappear. Well, how has that worked out? But at any rate, I remember General Electric. We used to see the commercials for General Electric with a new toaster or a new refrigerator or all the things they were producing, and they'd always say, progress is our most important product. Everything was getting better and better, and it almost seemed like we were creating our own heaven on earth, so who needs a heaven in heaven? All of this shows a direction of history that people believed in at this time. But now comes something else at this time something that we call higher criticism. Now, a little bit of that we see in the 1700s, some of the idea that Jesus was a good man, a great teacher who taught that we should love and forgive one another, but then Paul came along in his epistles and twisted Jesus into a second person of the Trinity and twisted his message of love and forgiveness into a message of substitutionary atonement and salvation by grace through faith. But this really starts to develop in the later 1800s with a theory that we call the Graf-Wellhausen theory, or better known to many as the documentary hypothesis, or perhaps best known as the JEDP theory. Let me just ask, for how many of you have heard of this theory? A fair number of you have, a fair number of you apparently have not. 
So let's just explain this briefly. Now, when I was at St. Olaf College back in the early 60s, I was taught this theory. In fact, what I'm reading here out of my historical and theological foundations of law, but at any rate, I'm quoting here from Gottwald's A Light to the Nations, which was my Old Testament textbook my freshman year at St. Olaf College. One of the certain results of modern Bible study has been the discovery that the first five books of the Old Testament were not written by Moses. Notice that's not a theory, that's a discovery. And it's one of the certain results of modern Bible study. Others will say, scholars have agreed. I hate that phrase. Scholars have agreed means a few people that I read and agree with agreed. Or what it means is if you don't agree, then by definition you're not a scholar. The present Pentateuch was constructed from anonymous sources commonly designated J, E, D, and P at a, only at a relatively late date. And this is taught as fact in many places today. In fact, I'm sometimes surprised at how many leading Bible scholars in the conservative evangelical community have not heard this theory. But I'm even more surprised that I find that Many who are at the mainline seminaries are equally amazed that any educated or thinking Christian would possibly disagree or question this theory. Essentially, what the theory says is that Genesis through Deuteronomy were not written by Moses. Rather, there are four different authors. Now, we don't know their names, but one of these authors refers to God as Jehovah, and so we call him the J-writer. But sometimes we find that in those first five books, God is referred to as E, Elohim. That can't be the same writer, obviously, and if that's not obvious, I agree, I'll talk about that in a minute, but obviously that must be a different writer, so we call him the E writer, because he calls God Elohim. And then we have another who wrote the original form of Deuteronomy, and we call him D, the D writer, And then sometime, maybe at the close of the Babylonian exile in the 500s B.C., or maybe even a little later, a priest, who we call the P-writer, took the works of J.E. and D. and reorganized them, redacted, edited them, maybe added some material of his own, and put them in the form that they are today. Now, when my professors taught me this at St. Olaf College, I was a little disturbed by it. I didn't really have the background at that time to challenge it. And I thought, well, these men are obviously very, very devout Christians. They must be, or they wouldn't be religion professors. And they must be tremendous scholars, and they must have concluded through extensive, exhaustive scholarship that this is the way it must be. I'm just taking off my watch so I can check my time. You all heard about the man who whispered to his son in church, what does it mean when the pastor takes off his watch and sets it on the pulpit? I don't know, Dad, what? Absolutely nothing. But But in fact, this is not obvious from the scholarship. It's not obvious from the evidence. And so what I'd like to do is just share with you a few of what I consider to be some of the flaws of the JEDP theory. And I could name many more, but I'm just going to summarize about 14 errors in this. This is important because higher criticism is really the linchpin of liberal theology. First of all, I would say that different names do not different, indicate different authors. I could take you through all my writings and show you all the ways in which I have referred to my wife. All of them positive, by the way. But her name was Sophie Marlene Van Dyke. But she always went by her middle name, and so I'd calmly just say, well, Marlene says hello, or something like that. 
or Marlene Eidsmo, she might sign her name, or if it's a very formal document like a will, it might be Sophie Marlene Eidsmo, or Sophie Marlene Van Dyke Eidsmo, or on something semi-official like an airplane ticket, it might just be S. Marlene Eidsmo. We've also got another problem. Her birth certificate spells it M-A-R-L-E-N-E, and her Baptismal certificate spells it M-A-R-L-E-E-N, or maybe it's the other way around, but so she's, now that it's Social Security time, she's going through an identity crisis. But anyway, point is, different names do not necessarily mean different authors. Jehovah is God's name. That's how Jews would refer to him by name, and they would not even pronounce that name because they considered it so holy. Elohim was simply a generic word meaning God. A Jew might refer to the Roman or Greek or Babylonian gods as Elohim. So different names for God do not mean different authors. Second point I would make here is that of all the ancient manuscripts, and I was really intrigued by the presentation this morning where the pastor spoke about some of the ancient Hebrew documents and so on, No manuscript has ever been discovered that just contains J, E, D, or P. Every ancient manuscript we have shows it is an entirely integrated document. No Jewish writer or any other ancient writer ever referred to J, E, D, or P or ever suggested that these books were written by anybody other than Moses. Jesus himself, as well as Old Testament and New Testament authors, all attribute the Torah to Moses. Now that raises an interesting question. If Jesus says Moses wrote these books, and if he didn't, then what does that say about Jesus? Either he knew that they didn't write these books, but he said they did, in which case he wasn't truthful, or else He didn't realize that Moses didn't write these books, in which case he wasn't all-knowing. Either way, an attack upon the Mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch, as I see it, is ultimately an attack on the divinity of Jesus Christ. We notice also that when the law is rediscovered back in the archives of the temple, When Josiah is leading a religious revival in the 600s B.C., and they discover this ancient law of Moses, it's already an ancient document at that time. After the exile, we see that Ezra reinstates the law, indicating that it must have been a venerable institution at this time. You recall from the book of Esther that during the reign of Azuerus, and this is after the exile, but among some Jews that had remained in Babylon and Persia during this time, that Haman, who has a plot to destroy the Jews, is telling King Azuerus, telling him, you know, there is this group of people, the Jews, and they don't follow your law, they follow their own law. That tells us that the law of Moses was well known and venerated and accepted in this time. Now, after the return from the exile, and we have Galilee to the north and Judea to the south, in between we have Samaria, and whatever the faults of the Samaritans, we're told that they did follow at least part of the Mosaic law, indicating that it had widespread authority at that point. Another thing is that Wellhausen, the primary architect of this theory, assumed that These books could not have been written in the time of Moses because at that time the Hebrews were an illiterate people. Well, as we have seen from the presentation by Pastor Abramson this morning, that clearly is not the case. The Ebla tablets, which personally I think are probably of at least or greater significance even than the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Ebla tablets show that in the area of Mesopotamia, especially in the area around Ur of the Chaldees, around 2000 B.C., there are contracts that we find in those tablets and other writings on those tablets at that time. This is the area Abram came out of. In fact, there are even tablets there that have the name Abram, probably not referring to him, it just means it was a common name there at the time, but indicating that certainly there was literacy there. Likewise, there was literacy in 
Egypt, when Moses, if he is taken and educated in the palace of the Pharaoh, certainly would be taught to read and write. British Assyriologist A.H. Sace puts it this way. He says, This supposed late use of writing for literary purposes was merely an assumption with nothing more solid to rest upon than the critic's own theories and presuppositions. And as soon as it could be tested by solid fact, it crumbled into dust. First Egyptology, then Assyriology, showed that the art of writing in the ancient East, so far from being of modern growth, was of vast antiquity, and that the two great powers which divided the civilized world between them were each emphatically a nation of scribes and readers. Centuries before Abraham was born, Egypt and Babylonia were alike full of schools and libraries, of teachers and pupils, of poets and prose writers, and of the literary works which they had composed. The Babylonia of the age of Abraham was a more highly educated country than the England of George III. And then R.K. Harrison in his Old Testament history simply says concerning Wellhausen that, by the way, archaeology in the last 150 years has shown us so much of the ancient world that was not known before, and nearly all of it confirms the truth of Scripture. Not that we need it to confirm the truth of Scripture, but it's nice to have. But Harrison says, Wellhausen took almost no note whatsoever of the progress in the field of Oriental scholarship, and once having arrived at his conclusions, he never troubled to revise his opinion in the light of subsequent research in the general field. Well, other problems with Wellhausen's theory, his idea that there are contradictory accounts, for example, that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are two contradictory accounts of creation, they don't contradict. Rather, one shows general creation, the other shows specific creation. They don't contradict at all. In fact, if somebody was trying to blend ancient sources, they probably would have just eliminated one or the other rather than put them together just in the way they actually happened. Another, we point out, many will point out another error there that Daniel, in Daniel, chapter 1 verse 1 says that Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem in the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim. But his contemporary Jeremiah describes that same event and he says it was in the fourth year of the reign of Jehoiakim. Obviously a contradiction, right? No. Daniel is using the Persian system of dating the reign of a king. Jeremiah is using the Jewish system. In the Jewish system, when you take office, the day you take office starts your first year. A year later starts the second, third, and fourth, and so on. The way the Persians would number the years of a king, the first year was the year of accession, the year he took office. And then, after you've reigned a year, then starts your first year, just kind of like you're one year old on your first birthday, and so on. And so, this would be the third year by the Persian calendar, the fourth year by the Jewish calendar, and if some later Jewish writer had done this, he probably would not have been aware of the Persian system, and the very fact that we see this demonstrates that Daniel truly was written by Daniel himself. Well, we can look to the fact that, as Robert Dick Wilson of Princeton pointed out when he challenged this higher criticism, he says, why, if these books are written at a later time, is there no reference to a king anywhere in these first five books except for a prophetic reference in Deuteronomy? Why is there no reference to the to Zion, no reference to the temple? Wouldn't all these be there if this was a later writing? He asks, if all of this is written after the return from the Babylonian exile, why are those first five books written in Hebrew rather than in Aramaic? And other points that we can make, but I think possibly the most important of all is to note that what really drove Wellhausen's thinking was Darwinian evolution. Herbert Hahn was one of the higher critics himself. He held the same view, and in his book, The Old Testament and Modern Research, he said concerning Wellhausen, 
he consciously based his exposition on the evolutionary view of history. From the evolutionary point of view, which assumed that development invariably took place from lower to higher forms, it was inconceivable that the nomadic ancestors of the Israelites could have held the lofty monotheistic conceptions ascribed to Abraham. Anyway, putting all these together, I think there are very solid reasons to reject higher criticism, solid reasons to reject this graph wellhausen theory. You need to be aware of it because many of the people you will be dealing with will assume it's true. But even more, you need to know why it is wrong and to be able to demonstrate that it is wrong. Several other movements that influence religious liberalism, one would be the existentialism of Kierkegaard. He has the redeeming quality of being a Dane, of course, and he takes the position that you can only come to Christianity by a blind leap of faith, and Christian existentialism, in a nutshell, takes the position that the Bible becomes the Word of God when we read it and believe it, not that it is objectively the Word of God. The social gospel by Rauschenbusch and others, the social gospel that teaches that really what we are trying to do as Christians is not save souls for eternity. We're trying to change conditions here on earth. We're trying to work for peace, the elimination of poverty and other such things. We call it social justice today. The problem with that is that it has its own definition, which is contrary to what I would call social justice. But anyway, we're not working to save souls. We're simply trying to engage in social activism here on earth. And then in the 1880s, we have the Theosophist or Wisdom of God movement of Madame Blavatsky and others, which leads to the modern New Age, the postmodern, the deconstruction movements of today, but those really come after the heyday of religious liberalism. But all of these lead to this movement today that we call religious liberalism. Well, we've talked about factors now that have led us up to this, but what really is religious liberalism? I'm going to offer several things that I think could be main characteristics of religious liberalism. One of the first would be a denial of absolute truth. The idea that truth is relative, it is subjective, it is evolving, it is changing with time, and what's true for you may not be true for me, and vice versa. Second, an emphasis on man rather than God. We think of the catechism, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. No, the religious liberalism instead would say that what is the chief end of God? God's chief end, if he exists, is to glorify man and enable man to enjoy himself forever. Next, a presumption against the miraculous to suggest very strained interpretations of the miracles of Scripture. I always enjoy the story about the, the man who was reading his Bible in the book of Exodus and shouting, glory, hallelujah, and a liberal preacher walks by and says, what are you so excited about? Oh, it says here that the Israelites passed through the Red Sea and the Red Sea was parted and so they could pass on dry land. No, no, that's not really what happened. What really happened, you see, is it was a northern part of the Red Sea known as the Reed Sea, and it's very shallow and the wind blows. Water's only about six inches deep. That's what really happened. And he walks on and he hears, Glory, hallelujah! Well, now what are you so excited about? Now I'm reading that God drowned the Pharaoh and all his armies and horses and chariots in six inches of water. Strained interpretations rather than accept the obvious, which is a miracle of God, either that or simply deny that it ever happened at all. Rudolf Bultmann spoke about demythologization. And when I was asked to actually drag kicking and screaming to teach a course called Contemporary Theology, which I didn't want to teach very badly, but as I got into the course, I saw its value. We need to know this contemporary theology. I had previously been of the view that Baltman was deliberately trying to destroy Christianity with his demythologization. 
I think he may have really thought he was saving Christianity and that we were moving into a scientific age that wouldn't accept miracles and only by demythologizing Christianity could Christianity be saved. But taking the miraculous and the supernatural out of Christianity is taking the baby out with the bathwater and really leaving only the bathwater. And it was a very destructive philosophy regardless of what the motive might have been. A low view of Scripture. Scripture is the work of man, not the work of God. Now, some will not go quite that far. Some will say that it becomes the Word of God when we read it and believe it. Christian existentialists like Kierkegaard would take that position. problem with that is Scripture itself says, Though we deny him, yet he abideth faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Scripture says, let God be true, and every man a liar. Scripture is objectively true, whether we believe it or not. Then you have a view that the Scriptures are inspired, but not inerrant. And you'll hear that many times, especially out of the neo-Orthodox. Now, I don't doubt their sincerity in holding that view, but I don't think that's a tenable view. If we're going to say that God inspired the Scriptures, but that there are errors in Scripture, that leaves us with one of two possibilities. Either God inspired only the parts of Scripture that can, do not contain error, in which case we place our higher critics as the ultimate judge of what is Scripture and what is not, or we have to say that God inspired all of the Scripture, including the error. Now, if we take the second position... Then we're faced with another dilemma. Did God know they were errors when he inspired them? If he did, then he is not truthful. If he did not, then he is not all-knowing. Either way, I have to say that the inspired but not inerrant position is one that is simply intenable. Another that you'll hear is that the Bible is accurate in its theological concepts. The fact of sin, the deity of Christ, the substitutionary atonement on the cross, justification by grace through faith, it is accurate in these concepts, but it could be wrong on historical and scientific details. Now, the problem with that view is that some of these historic and scientific details are empirically verifiable, whereas doctrines of sin and salvation are not. Now, if we can't trust the Bible on that which can be empirically verified or falsified, how can we trust the Bible on those things that cannot, that have to be taken on faith? Again, I would say that the accurate in theological conclusions, but not necessarily accurate in detail, I would say that is a view that is just as untenable as the inspired but not inerrant view. And then one of the reasons I think we need to be especially concerned about this today is that we see what is developing the emergent church today, and it's very difficult to define what the emergent church is. It claims to be evangelical, but essentially the idea is we love Jesus, but we're not going to get all concerned about doctrine, about details, about matters like that. And I think we have a new generation of evangelicals that are growing up today that buy into a lot of that. Things that we assume that all Christians, all evangelical or orthodox Christians understand, like the authority of Scripture, like the fact that we have original sin, like the fact that Christ died for our sins and so on, we assume that all generations of Christians understand these things. I think we are raising a generation of Christians that don't understand those things. And that is all the more reason why we need to be very concerned about teaching about these errors and showing why they are errors today. Well, let's move on now and look at some of the dangers of religious liberalism. And if you're following the outline, this is on the second page. First of all, it doesn't save. We don't need a great teacher. Oh, we can benefit from one. And we don't need a great example. We can benefit from one. But our primary need is for a Savior. 
to pay the penalty for sin, to satisfy God's justice by dying on a cross. If Christ is not the Savior of the cross, he's not our Savior at all. Religious liberalism simply doesn't save. It doesn't form a solid basis for morality. Morality becomes relative to the culture and from there on even to the individual. It doesn't give us a basis for evangelism or for missions. Why should we be sending missions to missionaries to Asia, Africa, and other parts of the world if all religions are equally good? If all religions are paths to God, why should we be trying to convert anybody? Why witness to anybody? I heard of a story about a young man who had recently been saved, went to a church with a pastor who had probably more degrees behind his name than my thermometer does, and my thermometer is wrong most of the time. But anyway, this preacher in a very polished way proclaimed that all paths lead to God, that there is truth in every religion, and everybody should choose his or her own religion and follow it with all sincerity. Well, as the young man was walking out, kind of disappointed, the preacher it was very polished. Well, young man, it's so good to have you here this morning. So what do you think of the service? Well, I don't know. I don't know if I really want to talk about it. Well, come on. Tell me, tell me about yourself. What is your, what is your religious belief, young man? Oh, I don't think you really want to hear my religious belief. No, I really do. I'd really like to know. You know what I just said? That all religions are true and all religions lead to God. Now, come on. What is your religious belief? Well, sir, my religious belief is that you are going to hell. <laughs> Pat paused a moment and said, let me correct what I said. All religions are true except yours. <laughs> the most open mind in the world is always going to be closed toward absolutes. But why should we be sending missionaries to these other countries if all religions are equally paths to God? Why not just send social workers? Frankly, that's a lot what a lot of the liberal churches are doing. As a result, why should we be asking somebody or encouraging somebody to join our church? And the truth is, in many cases, they don't. One of the results of this is that every church in America today has adopted religious liberalism is declining. And frankly, in my opinion, that's good. Another is that there is no basis for freedom without a biblical view of law and government. I think my outline said under, I meant without. Without that, what is the basis for freedom? We can look back to Germany. We can look to the Battle of Tudorburg Forest where the Roman legions were driven back and the common law of northern Germany, the Angles and the Saxons, and Scandinavia was preserved free of the centralizing influence of Roman law. You have a monument up there at New Ulm commemorating Hermann the Liberator from that battle, which I consider to be one of the most significant battles in the history of the Western world. We can think about Luther. And Luther, by the way, had studied law. And in studying law, Luther was a staunch defender of the old Germanic common law and a staunch opponent of the efforts of the Holy Roman Emperor and of the Pope to impose Roman law. I think that is one reason, though not the only reason or the main reason, why many of the northern princes of Germany backed Luther. Not their main reason, but one reason. The beauty of the music of Bach and so many other things that Germany gave us, and yet that same Germany that same Germany gave us Hitler and the Third Reich. How could that be? I'm going to suggest to you that for a hundred years before the rise of Hitler, there was a studied campaign in Germany to eliminate almost all traces of real Christianity. That you see Darwinism, especially with the German apostle of Darwin, Heichel, Nowhere in all of the world did Darwinism take root more quickly and more eagerly than in Germany. And after a century of this, after a century of the rationalism of Leibniz, of the romanticism of Schleiermacher, of the 
optimistic dialectic of Hegel, of the pessimism and Arianism of Schopenhauer, the nihilism and existentialism of Nietzsche, Wellhausen's higher criticism, Baltman's demythologization, Rauschenbusch's social gospel, all of this had created a spiritual desert in which Nazism and its pagan roots found a very fertile field. There was a writer in Germany in the 1830s, Heinrich Hein, who I think prophesied the rise of Hitler in very, very dramatic terms, writing in 1834, he said, Christianity, and that is its greatest merit, has somewhat mitigated the brutal German love of war, but it could not destroy it. Should that subduing talisman, the cross, be shattered, the frenzied madness of the ancient warriors, that insane berserk rage of which Nordic bards have spoken and sung so often, will once again burst into flame. The old stone gods will then rise from long ruins and rub the dust of a thousand years from their eyes. And Thor will leap to life with his giant hammer and smash the Gothic cathedrals. Thought precedes action as lightning precedes thunder. When you hear a crashing such as has never before been heard in the world's history, then you know that the German thunderbolt has fallen at last. At that uproar, the eagles of the air will drop dead, and lions in farthest Africa will draw in their tails and slink away. A play will be performed in Germany that will make the French Revolution look like an innocent idol. Heinrich Hein, 1834. What does all this tell us today? We think about our Christian heritage in this country. A heritage is not something to rest upon. A heritage is something to build upon or lose it. All these heresies, of course, Germany went through them rather quickly. And when Germany gets tired of them, they're exported to America. John Warwick Montgomery has said that America is the elephant's graveyard to which old German heresies go to die and maybe old German heretics as well. How then do we stand for the truth of God's world against this false view of religious liberalism? Again, we understand that within Lutheranism, higher criticism didn't hit Lutheranism as quickly as it did some of the other denominations. But by the middle of the last century, it was certainly present, and in some parts of Lutheranism, it had become dominant. Now, your battle here with informing the ELC concerned more of an issue of election. In our Association of Free Lutheran Congregations, we were formed out of churches that refused to go along with the ALC merger because we saw that when they would not take a stand for biblical inerrancy, they were on a slippery slope which could lead anywhere. Honestly, I don't think any of us in our wildest dreams imagined that it would lead to married gay clergy and things like that. But once you take away the standard of biblical inerrancy, even that is no longer a barrier. So the first thing is know God's word and stand on God's word. The next, and here's where we have such a rich heritage, know the Lutheran confessions and the Lutheran dogmatics. But next, understand the philosophies of the world that we're dealing with. Now, I don't say that children should be exposed to these immediately. They shouldn't be exposed to them before they've been given a firm foundation in the truth. But it is hard to combat these ideologies without understanding them. I don't know how many of you remember the old movie Patton. I always enjoy war movies. Next to Western movies, they're my favorite. My the one kind of movie I hate are lawyer movies. <laughs> With the partial exception of Jag, that's pretty good. But remember the movie Patton? When Patton is repelling an attack in North Africa by Rommel's Air Force, and Patton has a respect for Rommel, he shakes his fist in the air of those planes and says, Rommel, you magnificent, and I'm cutting out a word here, I read your book! A basic principle of military warfare is know the enemy. Know what these people believe. 
know where they're getting belief, know where they're getting their ideas and what authorities they respect. Only when we understand them are we in a position to refute them. Next, study and practice apologetics. I am so thankful that Al Quist has written this book, The Reason I Believe. I'm teaching a class for the Institute of Lutheran Theology on Christian apologetics. I've been using kind of the standard textbook, Geisler's Christian Apologetics, but this year, this spring, I used Alan Quist's book as well. And I have to tell you, the students liked it better. If you haven't gotten that book, I certainly encourage you to get it and read it. But study and practice apologetics. And honestly, when it comes to defending the faith, the only reason I'm at all effective in defending the faith is that I have made an idiot out of myself so many hundreds of times, but then have kind of reflected, what did I do wrong? And when I do that, then I can try to think of how I can avoid making that mistake in the future, which frees me up to make other mistakes instead. But study and practice apologetics. Next, attack ideas and not people. You don't have to hate the person you're dealing with. You don't have to say that person is an evil person just because you disagree with the person's ideas. Deal with ideas, not personalities. And as you do that, have opponents and not enemies. From my old martial arts days, I always used to like to say that a true warrior does not have enemies. He has opponents. And when I'd be out there in the martial arts court and I'd be facing against a black belt like this, and we'd be standing in our position like this, and bow to each other, best wishes, sir, good luck, sir. Then at the command, we go out and we kick the stuffing out of each other for a couple of minutes, and then at the command, a couple, which feel like a couple of hours, by the way, then at the command in Korean, come on, which means stop, then you immediately freeze in place, come back to attention, bow to your opponent, shake hands, well done, sir, good fight, sir. If you can do that with a black belt that's trying to kick your head off, you can do it with an ACLU lawyer who's trying to get God out of the public schools, or with an atheist who's challenging your religious beliefs, or anyone else, and you'll be much more effective if you're dealing with ideas and not people, and if you see them as opponents rather than as enemies, and even more than as opponents, as souls for whom Christ died, and to whom you should be pointing them in the direction of salvation. And finally, I would say, defend biblical inerrancy. That is the watershed issue. When we get rid of that, we are on a slippery slope, and thereafter, anything goes. Would you like me to take a couple of questions before we begin the general question session? Yes. So if somebody has a question, we've got a few minutes here. Uh, just so you know what's going to go on here, uh, we'll take... Uh, a question or two right now, and then we'll take a quick break because we're going to set up some chairs here and ask the presenters to come up, and then we'll have them field questions from the audience. But does anybody have a question they'd like to ask specifically right now of Professor Eidsmo? Up to the mic, please. Donnie, you got to run. Thank you. <laughs> Identify yourself. Don Molstad, the chaplain here at Bethany Lutheran College. Yes. Thank you, very fun, very good. Uh, you mentioned at the end here about um, teaching children and youth to understand these philosophies and, and to be able to identify them and deal with them. And you said you have to be careful not to do it too early. So what do you think is an appropriate age or how do you know when it's the right time? I think that's gonna vary with each individual child depending on that child's maturity and other things like this. but. Generally speaking, I would say high school is probably a good age to begin their exposure to some of these ideas. And then as they get older, certainly more, certainly in college is a good place to explore them more, especially if they can do so in a Christian context like they can do here at Bethany. But generally, I'd probably start with high school. Before that, I would concentrate on building them up in the sound principles of Christian and Lutheran doctrine. The reason I ask is recently a number of books have been published uh, by the Barna Institute and I forget the other one, and about dealing with this issue, how many millennials and now Generation Z students have dropped away from the faith. And 
what they, what they seem to be suggesting is that uh, young people who fall away from the faith, it seems to, they start having questions and questioning things in scripture earlier than that, even in like sixth grade, and more of a like confirmation or pre-confirmation age. I'm no longer in the parish, but um, so I don't know if that, there's, there's, they seem to suggest that waiting till high school is too long. Or to, you're, you're, you're missing the boat in a sense. It's too late or something. So just if you want to, well, whatever. <laughs> That's why I asked the question. Okay, very good question. And there are a couple of books to this effect. One of them is titled Already Gone, suggesting that kids, at least by high school graduation, have been, even from evangelical homes, have left the faith. Another called Already Compromised that suggests that many of our Christian colleges have also eroded the Christian faith as well. I would say this, that Again, it's going to vary from one student to the other, one child to the other. But I would say that probably one of the reasons that they're getting away from the faith is they've never really been taught the basics of what the faith is. Now, I think a lot of it is going to depend on when they start asking questions. Certainly, if your kids come home and say, you know, we're, we're hearing in school about evolution. If they start questions like that and say fifth or sixth grade or even at earlier ages, they're starting to ask you questions about transgender and stuff like that, that certainly at this point you don't just simply say, we don't even talk about that. We're not going to ask me that when you get to high school. We're not even going to talk about it now. No, if they're asking you questions about it, then by all means respond to those questions. And certainly do your very best to keep the lines of communication open with your children so that they will talk to you about these things. There are probably a lot of questions that a lot of kids wouldn't feel comfortable asking their parents. Do your best to make sure they do feel comfortable, or if not, that there are other adults that they're comfortable talking to, adults that you can trust. I hope that helps some. Let's uh, thank our speaker here, Professor Eismo. Thank you. Wonderful job. Thank you.